Yate, Shio, and welcome to the eighth presentation of our Indigenous Speaker Series. My name is Dr. Nancy Maryboy, and I'm the founding president and executive director of the Indigenous Education Institute. I am Diné and Cherokee and have been working in the area of Indigenous education for many years. The Indigenous Education Institute, or IEI, along with NASA's Heliophysics Education Activation Team, NASA HEAT, is proud and honored to present a sense of place, indigenous perspectives of earth, water, and sky. Our eighth session of this speaker series features two amazing speakers, Doña Maria Avila Vera, a beloved elder and Mayan knowledge holder from the Yucatan, Mexico, and Dr. Isabel Hawkins, an astrophysicist from Cordoba, Argentina, formerly director of science education at the Space Sciences Library at the University of California at Berkeley, and currently working with the Exploratorium Science Center in San Francisco, California. They will be speaking today. The title of their presentation is Living with the Stars on the Day of the Dead. I would like to begin our series today with a heartfelt acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples of the whole world to honor our many participants from around the world today. Usually we acknowledge the land on which we are living or presenting, but in this day and age of virtual online realities, we are honoring all indigenous peoples from around the world. I also acknowledge that I reside on the ancestral lands of the saltwater salmon people of the Salish Sea, who have called this place home since time immemorial. And I honor the inherent and acquired treaty rights of the indigenous people of this location. IEI is a nonprofit institution with an all indigenous board and staff that has been in existence for over 25 years. We are located on San Juan Island, Washington State and on the Navajo Nation. Our mission is to preserve, protect and apply traditional indigenous ways of knowing to contemporary life with a focus on traditional indigenous ways of knowing um, and native education, environmental change, and sustainable, healthy environments on the earth, the water, and in the skies. Most of our work concerns the creation of collaborations with integrity between Western science and traditional indigenous ways of knowing. The presentations in this series have been chosen to reflect an awareness of the foundations of traditional indigenous thinking and living. In our native ways, everything is interconnected. So rather than a specific focus on biology, astronomy, or other separate disciplines, we will be presenting worlds of interrelationships and processes of reciprocity. Another focus for this speaker series is expanding awareness and understanding for cultural differences to support more successful and diverse working relationships, whether it be in education, national resource management, NASA, museums, science centers, or tribal communities. I also want to thank you personally for attending this webinar. The interest you have shown is overwhelming. We have almost 500 people registered from all across the United States. And we have participants from around the world, including Canada, New Zealand, Mexico, the Netherlands, South Africa, England, Spain, Guatemala, Australia, and Italy. It is also interesting and heartwarming for me personally that we have more than 65 tribes represented in our registrations for this presentation today. Most of our presentations for the sense of place, indigenous perspectives on earth and sky presentations have been recorded and can be accessed at the Indigenous Education Institute website shortly about a week following the events. Since you have registered by email, we will also share notices to you for our upcoming presentations. It is my greatest pleasure now to introduce you to our guest speakers and my very, very dear friends, 
Doña Maria Avila Vera and Isabel Hawkins. Doña Maria will be speaking in her traditional language, Yucatec Mayan and Spanish. Isabel will be speaking English and providing translations from Doña Maria. They have been colleagues for many years working together on Maya astronomy and culture. I think I wanted to say something else here too. Um, they have been traveling together and learning together from places in Mexico, Guatemala, Peru, Hawaii, the American Southwest, and even Japan. I personally was lucky enough to spend time with them both, along with their friends and colleagues, Don Pepe Huchim and Alonso Mendez, in a grand tour, including Palenque, Chichen Itza, and Uxmal. It was blistering hot, but wonderful to see the land and culture through their eyes. Doña Maria of Vera is a Maya elder, born in the village of Shul, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but you can correct me in a minute. <laughs> um, and raised in the town of Peto, Yucatan, Mexico. She is a steward of the traditions of her ancestors, using her life experience and native language, Yucatec Mayan. She's the mother of 11 children and the beloved grandmother and great grandmother. She shares her time between Petaluma, California and Merida, Yucatan. She actively researches the knowledge of the Maya by capturing the oral tradition of her people and sharing indigenous knowledge with her family, friends, and communities. She is one of the curators, the Maya curators of the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of the American Indians Living Maya Time website. Isabel Hawkins, PhD, is a bilingual and bicultural Latina from Cordoba, Argentina. Dr. Hawkins received her PhD in astrophysics at the University of California, Los Angeles in 1986. She worked for 20 years at the University of California, Berkeley on several NASA satellite projects and as the director of science education at the Space Science Laboratory. She is an astronomer and project director at the Exploratorium's Science, Arts, and Research Department. She consults for the Smithsonian Institution's National Museums of the American Indian and is a Fulbright U.S. Global Scholar. Dr. Hawkins has received six NASA awards for her leadership in science education. And now, finally, it is my greatest pleasure to introduce my dear friends, Doña Maria Avila Vera and Dr. Isabel Hawkins. Thank you so much, Nancy. Muchas gracias, Nancy. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. I'm going to start sharing the, the screen, but before we do, I want to say that uh, we're very grateful to the Indigenous Education Institute and NASA HEAT for hosting this presentation. It is an honor to be here and uh, alongside many of our esteemed, most distinguished colleagues and dear friends and um, that have been part of this series. It's an honor for us. And also I have been noticing all the greetings that come on the chat from so many people from around the world. Thank you so much for your support. Many familiar names of friends and family members and colleagues, we are really, uh, thankful for your support in attending this presentation. I am going to share now, um, and Chris will let me know if, if, if there is something that is not quite looking correct, but let's do this. How is it looking, Chris? It looks perfect. Great, thank you so much. So here's our, the, presentation Living with the Stars on Day of the Dead. And we want to share today that the experiences uh, that we will show you took place in the lands of Maya, Zapotec, and Mixtec indigenous people in Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, what we will show you are experiences that Doña Maria and I have lived together um, and have uh, shared together 
with our host families and we're so grateful for them and to them for having shown us their uh, Day of the Dead traditions. Um, today, we acknowledge that we're speaking to you from the lands of the Saklan indigenous people of Northern California. I'm going to ask now that Doña Maria introduce herself. She will do so in the Yucatec Mayan language. And we have been together for so many years that uh, I do understand what she says in her own language when she introduces herself. So I will be translating for you. But then she will continue in Spanish because my Yucatec Mayan is not that good for me to be able to translate all the deeper knowledge that she will share today. So Doña Maria, les digo que eh, usted se va a presentar en su idioma maya yucateco y lo poquito que yo sé puedo traducir de su presentación, donde nació, un poquito de su, de donde aprendió su conocimiento, por mm -hmm. favor. Pues en Huetlat es Xochiqui Macbo y Gilín Vilquez, doctora Nancy, y este lo hijo, y este tu la creyano de obra y el lugar de Xochiqui Macbo y Xochiqui Macbo. She says that uh, she wants to uh, share with you that she's very happy to be here today. She's so happy to see all of you, Nancy, Nancy's son, and everyone else that is here joining us. Uh, she says that uh, she's happy to be here on this midday. She called it you know, midday. Um, and so that she can share with you some of the traditions of Hanapishan, which is Day of the Dead or feeding of the ancestral spirits. Uh, she says her name is Maria Avila Vera and that she was born in the town of Shul, Yucatan. She says that she uh, didn't have much formal study. Uh, she was only able to attend uh, up to second grade of schooling. And she says the reason why she couldn't continue is because the school uh, didn't allow her to go to school wearing her traditional dress, as you can see that she's wearing today, and that they uh, forced the students to wear uniforms and her family couldn't afford them. Uniforme. And so she says that um, because the uniform was a requirement, she couldn't continue in school. They, they basically told her she couldn't come back. But she, was, she feels that her uh, knowledge is really the result of her deep relationship with her grandmother, who gave her uh, the gift of traditional knowledge. And she says that she learned so much from her grandmother, all the stories and all the knowledge of her community and of the old, the old ways through her grandmother. Thank you, Doña Maria. Thank you. Hachi abach ni pola al titech. Mishba. Mishba. Hachi ki matin wali wali titech. Beishante. Tulaklech. Tulaklech. Ni pola al titech. And that's me in front of the <laughs> Sarah Tololo Inter-American Observatory uh, telescopes that I was fortunate enough to use for my postdoctoral work. Uh, my name is Isabel Hawkins. I am um, originally Isabel Treco Garcia from Cordoba, Argentina, and I grew up um, 
spending every summer in a ranch called El Cercado, which uh, was in the northern part of our, my province, um, part of the ancestral land of the Inca Empire, the Koya Suyu. And um, my good fortune was to grow up in a place that had no electricity and no running water. And every summer we would go there. Uh, during the regular school year, of course, we were in the big city in Cordoba where I went to school and my family lived uh, year round, but then the summers we would spend there. And it was that fascination with the deepest, darkest sky when we had no moon that really connected me with the stars and kindled my first love of the stars. Today, we're gonna to share with you the traditions of Hanapishan, which in Yucatec Mayan, as Doña Maria told us, means the feeding of the souls, uh, Dia de Muertos or Day of the Dead. This is a very special time of year. Um, Doña Maria, I'm gonna ask you to share with us um, a little bit of what we're seeing in this beautiful photographs of Day of the Dead altars. Por favor, si nos comenta un poco que vemos aquí en estos altares. Mm -hmm. En español, por favor. Este, pues ahorita estamos viendo aquí en estos altares todo lo que la tradición de nuestro Yucatán. Since we're seeing in these altars the Yucatec tradition of, of making Day of the Dead altars. Aquí es lo que todo se, se presenta cuando la, la familia están presentes para, para la acción de gracia, para llamar a los... A los Fieles difuntos les prenden sus velas. So it says that this is a time for the family to gather, to give thanks, um, to intentionally uh, invite uh, our dearly departed to come back and visit. And we, as you can see, there's lots of candles and other, other flowers and other decorations, which are really a way of inviting them to come and visit. Aquí ya está puesta la comida. Y en ese otro lado estamos viendo las, las personas que tienen hecho como un caminito, ¿no? Y ese camino es como para que inviten a los fieles difuntos con las oraciones de eso que están ellos haciendo, como para que los inviten a, a subir hasta el cielo. So you can see that um, we have a, an altar on the left. There's a lot of food on the altar as well. Those would be the favorite foods of the dearly departed. You see these almost like two roads made of uh, flower petals and candles. And that is uh, a way for the um, spirits to find their way to the altar so that they can come and partake of the food and, and be with the families. So now I'm, go I'm going to uh, begin by uh, giving you uh, a context of, of astronomy, uh, which are some of the concepts that you may be more familiar with, such as solstices and equinoxes are, of course, um, concepts that were known by ancestral Maya are still known today by contemporary tribal communities in Mesoamerica. But I will also introduce with to you other concepts uh, like zenith passage and nadir passage of the sun, and we will uh, learn about those together and understand how they pertain to this particular time of, of year, which is Day of the Dead. So let's begin with solstices and equinoxes. And we're going to talk about what is a solstice, what is an equinox. When I was a postdoc at UC Berkeley, I used to uh, watch uh, outside my window because used to, the Space Sciences Laboratory is up high on the hill above the Berkeley Hills. And you have this spectacular view of the bay, including the Golden Gate. And this is basically the view that I would see I looked from a little bit farther out. But I started to notice how the sun would set, this is looking west, would set each day on a different part of the horizon. And it would go back and forth on doing a full cycle in, um, during the uh, 365 days, so from solstice to solstice or equinox to e equinox, whatever, whatever time I wanted to, to watch that displacement, I was able to see it. And that really established with me a, a personal connection with the sun. So I was up in the space sciences laboratory uh, working on NASA satellites and also studying heliophysics and leading a, a heliophysics um, science education program. Uh, but I have to say that my personal connection with the sun uh, is something very precious. And that is what has been carrying me forward in wanting to do more of this work and sharing this work 
trying to uh, mentor students and entice more and more of uh, people from our, our cultures uh, to be able to participate in the work of science and the work of, of NASA by bringing all of their cultural intelligence to bear into their work. So uh, next I'm gonna show you just this demonstration. This is of course an illustration of how the sun would move from day to day in the horizon. So if you could do that yourself, find yourself a spot, look east or west, the same spot each day, and then watch to see how the sun rises or sets in the horizon. And you will see that it moves along the horizon, along this path until it gets to a point in which we'll rise on the same spot for four days or so in a row. And that's one of the solstices because solstice means sun stands still. Um, and that's what is actually happening. The sun is standing still on the horizon four days in a, in a row as it rises also sets on the other side. And then um, six months later, it will do so on the other side four days in a row. So that's what defines solstices and equinoxes are actually halfway in between on this path of the sun going back and forth. In our work with archeologists and uh, Maya knowledge holders in the Yucatan, we have also ascertained that the Maya words for these uh, sun stations in the horizon actually are describing this motion of the sun. So in Yucatec Mayan, solstice literally means the end of the road of the sun. And then equinox means equal day and night. We also have other concepts in astronomy called the cross-border days. And cross-border days have a special significance for uh, this time of year. For example, Halloween uh, happens in a cross-border day and also other uh, festivities like Groundhog Day, for example. Um, but what is a cross-border day is the day in between equinoxes and solstices. So you can see the marking here on that horizon. This is another representation of kind of the wheel of time and the wheel of the seasons with the June uh, solstice or the summer solstice in the Northern hemisphere up at the top. And you can see that as you, if you go um, uh, counterclockwise, you will uh, first encounter the first cross-border day in early August, then the equinox, the second cross-border day around Day of the Dead or Halloween, then the uh, winter solstice, uh, Groundhog Day or early February for the other cross-border day, equinox in the spring, and then May Day or the May cross-border day, um, which will be between the spring equinox and the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. So these days are actually dividing the year into this beautiful symmetric eight-part um, time zones, if you wish. So of course, these uh, solstices and equinox, these, these uh, solar um, positions were well understood by the Maya. Um, and the, they were actually uh, recorded through uh, observations that aligned the position of the sun, what the sun would do with respect to sacred architecture, like this pyramid of El Castillo and Chichen Itza, which is actually a solar pyramid because it has uh, four uh, staircases, each of them with 91 steps. If you add those up, plus the temple on the top, you have 365. So this is actually a solar uh, temple or a solar structure. Um, and during the equinoxes, a, um, a, a snake of light and shadow is formed by the appearances of uh, seven isosceles triangles that you can see sliding down that balustrade. And at the very bottom, there's a snake head that has been carved in stone. This represents Kukulkan or the feathered serpent, which comes down and descends during the equinoxes. It is a representation of sunlight and the energy of the sun to reach the earth and prepare the land for planting. And the same thing occurs in uh, September when the harvest um, is actually happening. Uh, in Civil Chaltun, uh, uh, the equinox is marked at the Temple of the Sun uh, when the face of the sun actually comes through the center, the central portal of the structure. Um, in Ushmal, we have worked with our uh, colleague Jose Huchim, uh, who is um, the director of the archaeological site. 
This is the beautiful side of Ushmal, as you can see, with the pyramid of the soothsayer, quadrangle, uh, and up on the upper left on a, on a almost like a, a grassy pedal, pedestal is what is called the palace of the governor. In this palace of the governor, there is um, a solstice alignment in which actually the entire width of the structure uh, is uh, the path of the sun behind it on the horizon. Because in the Yucatan, there are no, no natural mountains. So basically the structures, the pyramids, and these other structures on pedestals would um, mimic the role of horizon features to be able to measure and predict solstices and equinoxes. So during the solstice, basically from June to December, the sun will rise aligned with one edge of the building and then the other. So the sun's path actually spans the entire width or the parameter of this building. And that's a picture of our friend Jose Huchin who kindly shared with us this knowledge. Now, I wanna to introduce to you another con two concepts which are very important, which uh, is called the zenith passage of the sun and the nadir passage of the sun. Zenith being above, nadir directly underneath. This is a phenomenon that only occurs within the tropics or within 23 and a half degrees north latitude and 23 and a half degrees south latitude. This is just a very, simple visual representation of what we mean by zenith and nadir. If you're an observer, you look directly above, you will see the sun above you. And then the sun, uh, that would be at noon, your, your local noon. And then uh, nadir passage would occur when the sun is directly below you at midnight. So let's talk a bit about the zenith passage of the sun because in my conversations with Anya Maria over the years and actually being in the tropics with her during zenith passage, uh, she taught me a lot about how this particular um, solar occurrence was known by her ancestors, was known by her grandmother, and how she herself knew how to observe it. Um, so here on the left, we see our friend Alonso Mendez, who is at the Mayas uh, archeological site of Becan. Alonso is a very accomplished cultural astronomer. He's also done research in Palenque and other areas. And Zenith Passage and Nader Passage are, are some of his specialty. Um, so you can see that where he's standing, his shadow is completely uh, and directly underneath him. Um, and now I'm gonna ask Doña Maria to tell us about these other photographs because these are some of her own experiences. Les digo, Doña Maria, que ya les comenté de Alonso, que está en, en el sitio arqueológico de Becani, que está pisando su propia sombra. Y si usted puede describir la foto donde estamos en el medio o la otra foto del pozo. Pues en todo, en todo lo que, en todo lo que ya les explicó la doctora Isabel, tenemos esta, esta, esta enseñanza de ver la sombra. Cuando ahorita, como en estas épocas, porque estamos en el tiempo de que el día está corto, está corto el día y la noche está larga. So she says that uh, observing shadows has always been important and, and it kind of, uh, um, supports all of the other uh, explanations that we have seen so far. She, she's kind of acknowledging <laughs> the explanations that I have given you. But uh, she said that observing shadows is really important. Like for example, during this time of year, you can notice that um, the uh, length of day will be very short compared with the length of night will be very long and the shadows are different. ¿Y cómo se dice el paso cenital en, 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 en Maya? I'm asking her how you say en, zenith passage in, in Maya. Eh, como que, como que va, va cruzando, ¿no? Va cruzando el sol. Joko kin, chumu kin, ubin kin. So she says that the sun will actually go up in an arc and it will be the rising of the sun. Chumu kin being the middle of the sky, the sun is directly above, and then it will set on the other side. ¿Por qué se dice eso? Porque en las mañanas cuando sale el sol, a las seis de la mañana, a mediodía a las doce, es cuando uno se para y como estamos viendo aquí, Alonso que tiene pisado su sombra, esa es la señal de que está en la mitad del día. Mm -hmm. Y sucesivamente los abuelos respetaban que también el, el sol alumbraba en medio del pozo 
y se veía todo el fondo del pozo. Y, y te decía, no vas a secar porque vas a perjudicar la luz del sol que está alumbrando. Y también aquí vemos otro ejemplo de, de que las tres sombras que se ven allá es la señal de que estamos a mediodía. So she said that what, um, what she was able to observe, guided by her uh, grandparents, was that the sun will rise into the middle of the sky. And when it is directly above at midnight, that's when your shadow will be directly below you, like we see from Alonso's picture on the left. And also the three um, folks that are sit, uh, standing in the middle, Doña Maria, uh, Luis Lopez Tuyub, and Marisol Itzakuk, they're also Yucatec Mayan. There are our godchildren and, and our students. And uh, we were there in Lake Atitlan in Guatemala. And you can see that our shadows are directly below you. She also said that the picture on the right is actually a water well. And you can see that there's a shaft of light going down to the bottom that is during Zenith Passage. She says that her grandparents would say, do not go and look, don't get water from the well. This is a sacred time. This is the time for the sun to be shining at the bottom of the water. So you do not go and disturb it. So they knew that that was a moment in which the sun was directly above. Y cuando usted saltaba la sombra, como era eso? Oh, there's another story she told me too about how she would, uh, you know, interact with a, with a shadow when she was a child. Sí, pero yo en esa época como soy una niña que no sabe nada de eso, ¿no? Y... Y a mí me gustaba brincar así donde está mi sombra, a ver si no se perdía o a ver si no se movía. Y, y mis abuelitos me decían, no, no hagas eso. Es como que te estás burlando del santo sol. Mm -hmm. So she says that she liked to jump around and see if the shadow would follow her and how come the shadow was always underneath her. And so she would jump around and try and, and uh, get away from the shadow. But her grandmother would say, don't, don't play with that because you, it's as if you're, you're making fun of what the sun is doing and you have to respect. So this is a time for you to pay attention. And so she was saying that she always wanted to play, but her grand, grandmother would say sometimes, no, you have to pay attention. Um, and here is uh, this amazing photograph that was taken by another of our esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Brian Mendes from the Space Sciences Laboratory at UC Berkeley. And you might notice what is weird about this picture because look at all the people. The people around the pyramid, none of them are casting a shadow because they're all stepping on their own shadow. This was taken uh, May 22nd, which is Zenith Passage at this latitude. And if you see the trees, the trees are also stepping on their own shadows. So this is a very eerie time to be there when um, the, the sun is directly above. And of course, this kind of phenomenon was um, uh, recorded in many different ancestral sites, not just Maya, but also Zapotec in Montalban and Oaxaca. Uh, these are all around the period of 800 uh, current era, approximately. But on the left, you have a stella or a almost like an obelisk or a column that would again um, cast no shadow during the Zenith Passage. The same thing happens in stellas or other vertical monuments in Uxmal, the, the middle picture. And then the one on the right is, is significant um, because it was an intentional uh, observatory called a Zenith tube that was designed to be able to me measure Zenith passage from year to year very accurately. And if you do this over a period of more than 100 years consecutively, you can actually get a measurement of the tropical or solar year with greater precision than the Gregorian calendar. And so they use the Zenith passage to develop very accurate calendars. Now let's go to the Nader passage, which is the other, the opposite of Zenith, which is directly below. Um, in Palenque, Chiapas, Mexico, our friend Alonso Mendez did a lot of research on um, Nader Passage of the Sun and seeing how the buildings and structures are aligned to this particular phenomenon. Now, Nader Passage cannot be directly observed because it's when the sun is underneath you at midnight. However, it can be observed by um, noticing sunrise and sunset alignments with sacred structures on that day. So here, for example, is a sunrise on the Temple of the Sun, uh, which marks the Nader Passage. Now, if we go back to our little horizon uh, diagram, you can see that 
at the latitudes of some of the oldest Maya cities, such as Copan, or even some of the more contemporary, the contemporary cities like Quetzaltenango, Guatemala, for example, zenith, nadir, and cross-border days coincide. So look at the symmetries in the horizon. Um, the, the sky is, is equally divided um, uh, through these particular solar alignments. And what's uh, really fascinating is that it is known that uh, many of the current Catholic festivities in Mesoamerica are actually a representation of the original pre-colonial astronomical um, uh, understandings and astronomical festivities, which are in alignment with solstices, equinoxes, and cross-border days. So um, for example, uh, the June solstice in Guatemala, and this is knowledge that comes from our god children, um, Willy Barreno Minera and uh, Ishki uh, Post Salanik, they are also Maya calendar keepers, they're Maya Quiche. Um, and they have been able to map the Catholic festivities to pre-colonial astronomical festivities, as you can see. And they actually use this petateo, this pop, this uh, woven mat as a teaching tool that take it around. And of course that is, is uh, laid on the ground. Um, and then you can actually uh, identify the cardinal directions using shadows. And so this is also a teaching tool that they have used that combines uh, traditional knowledge with uh, contemporary knowledge. Now, when we uh, worked for the Smithsonian, which we, we still do, but uh, when we curated this uh, Living Maya Time website, which is a beautiful bilingual website in English and Spanish, um, talking about the astronomical knowledge of the, of the Maya, we created this uh, video called The Sun Above and the Sun Below that demonstrates um, the connection between the contemporary Day of the Dead festivities and the day of the Holy Cross, which is on May, early May. So those are two cross border days, early November and early May, and how they correlate with the current uh, festivities in, in Guatemala and Mexico, the land of the Maya. So that's the URL for you to refer to at an, an, another time, but let's watch this lovely video that we did in 2010. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. And oh, and I wanted to mention that um, uh, my, my dear colleague, uh, Bill Morty Sanchez, who is um, uh, in the education department, one of the leaders of the education department at the National Museum of the American Indian was uh, our champion and supporter throughout this work. And the, the work was uh, written and produced by myself, but uh, the curators were Doña Maria, Alonso Mendez, uh, Jose Huchim and uh, Jean Moleski Post and the Posarani family from Guatemala. Here's the video. In our Maya communities, many festivities are celebrated throughout the year. Day of the Holy Cross and Day of the Dead are linked to astronomy and to our legacy as expert watchers of the sky. Our ancestors observed and recorded two important astronomical events, the zenith and the nadir passages of the sun. Day of the Holy Cross is connected with the zenith and Day of the Dead is connected with the nadir. And so they divided the calendar year in two halves, uh, one half dedicated to life uh, and growth, the other half dedicated to death and the underworld. The first cycle dedicated to the sun in the zenith. Uh, the second cycle we now know is, is associated to the sun in the underworld, uh, which is the center of the underworld. This is uh, the polar opposite of the zenith passage. During the zenith passage, when the sun can be observed directly overhead at midday, the shadows of vertical objects disappear. In the ancient Maya city of Chichen Itza in the Yucatan, the zenith passage can be observed by watching the shadows disappear under hundreds of columns. During the nadir passage, the sun is directly underfoot at midnight and thus cannot be directly observed. The ancient Maya, however, were able to track the nadir passage indirectly by constructing buildings and temples that align with the sun at sunrise and sunset on that day. Maya communities celebrate Day of the Holy Cross on May 3rd. 
On this day, crosses are decorated and then hung outside our homes and throughout the town. This is also the day when the sun passes through the zenith at the latitude of the oldest Maya cities. Today, uh, still, there are groups that, that practice the, uh, and observe the dates of the, of the zenith passage in the ceremonies of the, of the Day of the Cross, which take place on the, on the 3rd of May every year. November brings the arrival of the nadir passage of the sun and the Day of the Dead. We build altars using the portraits of our beloved departed, water, candles, and traditional foods for the spirits of our ancestors. The town of Santiago Zacatepeques in Guatemala holds a unique Day of the Dead festival featuring a competition of giant kites at the cemetery. The kite festival has a long history that goes back hundreds of years and comes from our grandparents. From when I was a young child, the kites have been flying and I was taught how to make the kites. According to the history told by our elders, the kites enable the communication between the living and the dead, primarily on this date. Families clean and decorate the tombs with flowers and pine wreaths. The day before we purchase the flowers and we make the wreaths, then the next day we come and place the flowers on the dearly departed. Yes, this is our tradition. Throughout the day, a crowd of excited spectators comes to the cemetery to watch the kite competition. The giant kites, built by local youth, are propped up on the cemetery grounds and measure up to 65 feet or 20 meters in diameter. People also fly kites of all sizes and colors, and they write messages to their departed family members on the tails of these kites. The Day of the Holy Cross and the Day of the Dead are among the traditions that continue to affirm the teachings of our grandparents connecting us with our ancestors and honoring our relationship with the land and the sky. Well, that was uh, uh, very exciting to see those kites again, those giant kites go up uh, at the cemetery. We actually were hosted by Don Salomon, the, the gentleman that was making the wreaths. And it was a, a team of eight or nine people that went there and Doña Maria was, uh, was among them as well. So now we're going to share with you uh, the tradiciones de Dia de Muertos, the traditions, especially the ones from the Yucatan. Um, and we're going to uh, focus on how to make this uh, very special food that only uh, is done in the Yucatan during this, this time of year. So we're gonna focus on Mesoamerican traditions uh, we're going to begin with the Yucatan, and here Doña Maria will show you how to make this special uh, tamal, let's call it, but it's not really a tamal, it's a pib. Doña Maria, este es su momento. This is your moment, Doña Maria, to share uh, with everyone how to make this delicious food. ¿Qué quiere decir hanapishan? What does is, what is hanapishan mean? Hanapishan, comida de los, de los difuntos. It means the food of the dearly departed. The spirit. Or, or the spirits. Pishan spirit. is, is, uh -huh. is the spirit of spirit. the soul. Pishan in Maya is the spirit. Pishan in Maya means the spirits. ¿Y qué vemos aquí? Y tenemos esa tradición en Yucatán a los ocho varios de, de los días principales de difuntos. Se hace esa tradición de comida que se llaman, se llaman Pibes, también se le ha llamado mucbicollo. Y la otra con la roja. Y este. ¿Cómo era? Chacua. 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 Ok. So she says that um, at, uh, one week after uh, November 1st, actually on the 8th, the 8th uh, an, uh, day anniversary after uh, November 1st, so that would be November 8th, they actually cooked this special Chichacua. food Chichacua. and it's called pib it's called mukbi polio or chachacua which literally means red masa or red uh, corn masa mm -hmm. and now we're going to go through the process she'll share with you how it's made what do we see here eh, pues el trabajo de, de este 
de estos que ya vimos ahorita enteros. Es, es esto, viene como un caldo, un caldo preparado con pollo, pero se espesa con harina. So uh, she says that the first step is to get uh, chicken, in this case is chicken breast, and then you um, prepare a special broth uh, that will be thickened with masa flour. And that's what you see here cooking. And this is uh, Doña Maria's amazing uh, daughter-in-law, Irma Diaz, who has always been supporting us in all of our cooking projects. <laughs> y aquí, ¿qué es aquí tenemos el, el achiote que es que maya se llama tochu, que con eso se colorea el, el caldo del pollo que acabamos de ver. So she says that this is a picture of the special spice uh, called uh, chiote in Spanish or cuchu in Mayan. And um, on the inside, you see these little seeds. When those seeds dry, uh, you can grind them and it becomes a very, very intense red coloring and flavor that uh, is used to um, to make Sabia. to make the yeah here the it's already it's still green but when they're mature they have to be dry uh, and they turn into a coffee color on the outside and the inside it turns very very red and that's what they use to just to uh, give that red special color to the sauce. Y aquí estamos checando si ya está ya está a punto de sacar lo, las presas del pollo del del caldo. So in here, we're checking to see if the, the chicken itself is ready. So uh, Irma, her daughter-in-law, is consulting with, with, the, with the master here, to, and the master chef, uh, to see if the chicken is ready. Y allí se está cocinando el, el caldo. Se empieza a mover para que no se pegue en el fondo de la olla. So in here, uh, this is the thickened broth called pol in Maya, and, and you have to stir it very vigorously so it won't stick to the bottom of the pot. Y aquí estamos viendo los trozos del pollo que ya sacaron. Y aquí lo estamos desmenuzando. So you see the chickens ready on the left, and on the right, I'm just pulling it apart. Y aquí estamos viendo la mata de hoja. Esta es una mata de, de hoja de, es una mata de plátano que tiene sus hojas. Entonces, de estas hojas se va a agarrar para envolver el, el, la masa del pip que preparamos. Lo tostamos y luego le quitamos orillita. Y de esa orilla que vamos a quitar, vamos a amarrar lo que vamos a preparar con la masa, el pollo y el caldo. So he says, then I, I'm going to my backyard and this is a plantain or a banana leaf plant. And what I do is I cut the leaves and then you have to uh, toast them on the open sí, flame pues, sí, so that they're, they're, they cook in a way, but also they become very pliable. And then you, you pull this little edge of the banana leaf and that's the, the little string that you pull out will serve for you to tie the wrapped um, peep that will be made with corn masa. Y acá estamos preparando en este lado, estamos preparando la, el cosito para poner la, el pollo con el caldo. So we're y esas prepared. son las hojas que están encendidas. You can see the, the banana leaves on the bottom uh, that will receive this uh, little container in a way made out of uh, masa. And that masa, corn masa container will be filled with the chicken and the special thickened broth that you see on the right hand side. Y esta masa que estamos preparando está mojado con manteca. Mm, so the masa, you have to mix it with uh, pig fat. Entonces aquí ya preparamos el, el cosito que estamos viendo y le ponemos los ingredientes que lleva, que es apazote, cebolla, tomate, Y hay personas que les gusta, se le puede poner chile habanero adentro. ¿Y usted come chile habanero, doña María? No. Le ico. Le ico. Se le pone. Chaba ik, yo lo pata. Se le pone chile para que esté picoso. So she says that uh, you can add other ingredients. For example, she added tomato, onion, and epazote, which is a, a native herb of, of the Yucatan. 
Um, but actually she says, if you like hot chili, you can put habanero chili in there. And so I said, well, do you eat chili? And she says, oh, no, 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 I don't eat chili. So we don't put that in there. Y aquí a la derecha. Y lo que vemos que atorreamos así a, a este lado, lo tapamos, lo tapamos muy bien. So I, uh, she also makes a lid, like you see on the left, there's, there's like a flat lid made out of masa. And then you just cover it on top. Y aquí ya está tapadito y le ponemos su, su colorete, como decimos, su color, su col. Su col. So here it, the, the peep has all been put together and covered up. And now you make sure you cover it very, very well with that bright red sauce. Su pintura. We're just like rouge. <laughs> <laughs> Luego se envuelve muy bien, como les dije, con la hoja. Y la orilla de la hoja se amarra, así como está amarrado. And you make a very neat, tight package with a banana leaf. And then with that uh, stringy edge of the banana leaf, it's that same uh, string that you use to tie it up. Y aquí lo estamos viendo que se lo estamos presentando a mi nieto para que vea que ya se terminó. <laughs> so uh, we showed my, uh, my uh, grandson who's there with me, actually. Her grandson is a California firefighter. So we're so grateful to him uh, who has been fighting all the terrible fires this summer. He was right in the thick of it. Um, and so we're very grateful for the service that he does to the community. His name is Luis and uh, he was there when we were making the pibes. Y aquí a la derecha and on the right Aquí lo estamos poniendo en el horno de la estufa. We put it in, our, in the oven to cook for an hour and a half. Por una hora, dos horas. Y, y como pues nosotros aquí en, en Estados Unidos no podemos escarbar la tierra porque está prohibido. Entonces la tradición de estos pibes, lo legal que se puede hacer es bajo tierra. So it says that traditionally in the Yucatan, we don't cook these in the oven. We do that here because they don't let us dig in our backyard. But in, traditionally, you would dig a big pit like this, mm -hmm. as you can see here. And the, the, um, the special... Uh, foods, those brown packages, will be cooked underground. Se escarba, como ya vimos, se escarba, se escora los pibes allá, se prende la leña con mucha piedra, y la piedra se calienta y quedan así como trozos de, de este, como piedra así prendida. So the stone, so you basically put a layer of, of coals, wood that turns into very, very hot coals. And then you put hot stones, which will become very red and very hot. And then you put a, a sheet of metal leaves. You put the, all the pibas or the round uh, tamales on top. And, oh, then yeah. put, and then you put more, more layers and cover it with dirt. Sí. Y luego pues ya se tapa. Y se, y se quita cuando se saca, luego se sirve, y a comer se ha dicho. <laughs> and then you take them out when they're ready. After a couple of hours, you uncover the dirt and cover everything. And then you unwrap the, the peep, as you see on the left. And then let's eat them because they're, they're very delicious. And they have a very crunchy uh, outside layer. They're not like a regular tamal, which is very soft. These will actually be crunchy. They're delicious. Y aquí aparentemente tenemos un sol que nos está alumbrando. Yeah, and it, and it ends up looking like the sun, as if the sun is shining on us. Sí, aquí tenemos. Y aquí es el altar de los difuntos. Bueno, este es que lo hice en mi casa, que es casa de ustedes. Y aquí tengo a toda mi familia que, que se fueron. Y tenemos los tres niveles del inframundo. So she says, this is the altar she wanted to show you that she created at her house and all the family members that who have passed um, recently and over the years are represented here through their photos. And you can see that the altar has three levels, which represent the three levels of the Maya, the Maya world. Aquí tenemos nosotros, el significado nosotros, los ancestros difuntos, Y el cielo. So the three levels represent the ancestors, the level of where we reside on the earth, and then the sky. Those are the three levels. And that's very typical of all the altars in Mesoamerica. ¿Y por qué le decimos el cielo? Porque está en el lugar en donde está 
como nos habló el, el, el hermano Alonso, que tiene el significado de la Santa Cruz, porque ahí están todas las fotos. So, and she says that was, uh, I will go back one image because she wanted to mention also that the, the sacred cross, as you can see, is always represented in the altars, just like Alonso told us. Um, so that is also a very important uh, component of the altars. And here, uh, I just wanted to make, make a comparison, especially since we are sponsored by NASA Heat, <laughs> but also because there is a, a direct um, correlation between this particular food, the shape of the food, the color of the food, where it is cooked, and the fact that the sun is in the underworld. So this, this uh, peep or the chachacua, which means red masa or red corn masa, is a literal representation of the sun in the underworld. Mm -hmm. And now we're gonna share with you our other experiences of Day of the Dead in Oaxaca and Guatemala. Um, muchas gracias, Doña María. Thank you so much. Now you're making me hungry, ¿no es cierto? She's making me very hungry. Está ganas de Muchas gracias a todas ustedes que, que lo poco que yo sé se los he transmitido y tal vez algún día nos volvamos a ver. She says that she wants to thank everyone for your kind attention to her recipe of the pibes and that she hopes that one day we will all be able to see each other. And now we're going to share with you the other traditions that we were so fortunate to share. Um, we visited a Zapotec family from Oaxaca, Mexico, the Hernandez Aquino and the Hernandez Hernandez family. And here we are. Y estas flores, Doña María, she's going to talk about the flowers. Estas flores, algo muy ligerito que estas flores nada más hay para en estos tiempos de, de todos santos, de los difuntos. Estas flores se llaman, en maya se llaman chistes, abanicos, tés. ¿Y las otras? El otro es lo que, lo que se le llama el spujul, que es el este, ¿cómo se llama? Sempasuchi. El sepachusi. Mm -hmm. So, it, you might know that the, some of these flowers that are pretty much only available during this time of year, especially in Mesoamerica. Terminando once, las, los finados. Yeah. Once Day of the Dead is over, those flowers are not blooming anymore. But they're very traditional. The ones on the left, the, the red ones are called shtes in Maya, and the ones on the right is called yeah. shpuhul in Maya. You might know them uh, under the name sempasuchi, but that's a Nahuatl word. And her own Mayan language is actually shpuhul. Uh, and here we also visited the town hall oh, where they put those beautiful uh, tapestries made of uh, flour, sand, uh, and other components and cal or the quicklime. Uh, and these are, this is the, the family that hosted us with the two grandmas always talking story. Um, and here uh, at the cemetery, they take musical groups um, to celebrate uh, the dearly departed and um, share with them the music that they would have enjoyed. So this is also in Simatlan de Alvarez in Oaxaca. Y aquí, Doña María, and here we are. Aquí estamos viendo, <coughs> perdón, estamos viendo el mismo altar parecido al de nosotros, ¿no? Solamente que acá la comida lo tienen puesto, este, demostrando los tres niveles, como habíamos dicho. So you can see that um, the three levels of altars, the underworld, the world, and the upper world are always represented, no matter whether you're in the Yucatan or, or in this case in Oaxaca. But in, uh, this woman put all of her food in baskets that are covered with special cloths. This was in Mitla in Oaxaca. Mm -hmm. And now we'll move over to uh, the highlands of Guatemala, where the um, our beloved Paul Salamik uh, family from Sunil Cantel uh, and Quetzaltenango, Guatemala hosted us. And their tradition, you can see Doña Maria on the upper left and I'm here on the, on the lower right. Their tradition is to gather flowers to make mm -hmm. uh, wreaths that then they take to the cemetery. Uh, and you can see also that there's some kites, tails of kites up at the top because when the winds come, that's always early November. As a matter of fact, it is not, uh, allowed traditionally to fly kites before the day of the dead because you will, will be calling the spirits prematurely. So the kites and the spirits are very tied together in Guatemala. 
We also ate this very delicious cold food called fiambre. And we went to a, a kite uh, art display uh, in downtown in which uh, we were at, there able to get our photo, photos with the kites, surrounded by the kites. It felt Muchas wonderful. Gracias. Y ahorita en los mensajes. Ahorita estamos viendo que así como ya vimos la tradición, la comida, la tradición de los altares, aquí en, en Guatemala también tienen una tradición muy, muy especial para ellos en los papalotes, digamos. So you have seen that it, depending on the region, there's different traditions. We focus on the uh, making that special food in, in Oaxaca. You know, they have the tapestries and the music at the, at the cemetery in Guatemala. The very traditional uh, component of Day of the Dead is the kites. Según para ellos los papalotes, que en Yucatán nosotros le decimos papagayo, pero ahí ellos le dicen papalote. Le ponen la cola de, de, un, de, unas, de unas pequeñas papeles, lo amarran, lo amarran, lo alargan. Y entonces en esos papeles que ellos ponen, escriben ellos el nombre de sus difuntos y un mensaje. ¿Por qué? Porque la, la idea de ellos de que ese papalote va a ir, lo va a llevar el aire y va a llegar al cielo en donde están sus difuntos y ahí ellos van a leer el mensaje que ellos les mandan. So one thing that she learned by uh, sitting down with some of the elders when we were there during the kite festival is that um, families will actually write messages to their dearly departed and write the names of the dearly departed in the tails of the kites. And so when the kite goes up into the sky and it will continue to go up high, it is a means of communication. Um, and the work that we wanted to also uh, point out that the work that we do is really to um, motivate, give strength to a new generation of cultural astronomers who are indigenous and who will be hopefully Doña Maria's family members or grandchildren, uh, some of the friends that we have visited in these families uh, in Guatemala and Mexico. And so we have done uh, lots of uh, workshops. As a matter of fact, this workshop was funded by NASA Heliophysics. Our friend Eric Christian was uh, the principal investigator of the Parker Solar Probe. He was actually here present at this workshop in Ushmal. That was back in 20, maybe 2008, perhaps 2009. And we invited all of the uh, communities to come and observe the sun through specially filtered telescopes. And here's Doña Maria as well. And the fact that Doña Maria was there wearing the same clothing as the children, it really made um, a, a cultural um, statement that was very important as a welcoming for the communities. Uh, and here we are in Guatemala, some of our colleagues there in the Quicotemal School in Quetzaltenango are doing workshops on astronomy, utilizing telescopes and demonstrations on faces of the moon, observing sessions. Uh, right there, they were observing the moon actually during the day. And here, uh, I love this photograph because uh, it shows Doña Maria and Tepeu Postalanik, who's a cultural astronomer from Quetzaltenango. They're both Maya, although he is Quiche Maya, Doña Maria is Yucatec Maya, and one from Guatemala, one from Mexico. But they are actually uh, a rep representing cultural exchange together through their traditional knowledge of astronomy. Uh, we did host, uh, as part of the Fulbright Fellowship that I'm under, the U.S. Global Scholar Fellowship from Fulbright, we hosted the first uh, Congress of uh, Mesoamerican Cultural Astronomy in Guatemala. You can find information here. This was in 2019. And I do believe that some of our colleagues from New Zealand who were there, uh, Arna and perhaps Aroha, I'm not sure if you, both of you are on, on this uh, presentation, but I think I did see your names. Thank you for coming. Kia ora, kia ora Arna. <laughs> and uh, this is the organizing committee. As you can see, it was a multicultural committee and that really bridged um, cultural astronomy, indigenous astronomy and academic astronomy. It was led by Dr. Tomas Barrientos. He is the chair of archeology span at the University of the Valley of Guatemala and Javier Mejuto, who is also a chair of archaeoastronomy and cultural astronomy in Honduras. Um, Ishkik Paz and Willy Barreno, who are ahkik, or 
uh, day keepers, Ernesto Arredondo, an astronomer also in Guatemala, an astrophotographer of international reviews, uh, Sergio Montufa, and myself were part of the um, committee that brought together this amazing international group. There were 13 countries represented, and it was really the first time in which uh, Western academics and indigenous scholars came together to learn from the university, to learn from the elders in traditional spaces, and to learn from the ancestral sites themselves. This is the group at the Copan archeological site in Honduras. So now I think that this completes our, our presentation, but before we uh, go to the questions and answers, I always love to ask Doña Maria to give uh, counsel to give her recommendations, to give advice to the future generations and her own grandchildren when it comes to how to, how to participate in the preservation of your culture uh, and your traditions. So I will ask her that again. So Doña Maria, yo digo que siempre me gusta terminar las pláticas preguntándole a usted qué consejos le podría dar a sus nietos, a las futuras generaciones para que continúen eh, preservando las tradiciones que usted nos ha contado hoy. Pues este... Pues el consejo más que yo quiero darles que me sale de mi corazón es que ellos aprendan a respetar y aprendan de sus abuelos. So she says the, the, the one... Uh, advice that she wants to give to the future generations is that they learn to respect and they learn to appreciate the knowledge of their grandparents. Porque de nuestros abuelos son los mejores maestros. Because our grandparents are the best teachers. Que llegamos a tener si uno lo, lo valoriza. And if we appreciate their knowledge and appreciate their wisdom, Learn to pay attention to them because then you will be able to learn. Aprender a respetar y aprender a preguntar si algo no estamos haciendo bien. Aprender a, a preguntar a las personas mayores y sobre todo más a respetar. So, and she says, don't be afraid to ask your grandparents um, ask them questions and if you have any doubts and if you feel that perhaps you may be going astray in your path, trust your grandparents to bring you back to the proper path so that you can thrive and that you can maintain your culture into the future. Muchas gracias, Doña María. Thank gracias, you so much. Doctora Isabel. Muchas gracias por todo compartir conmigo. He says, thank you so much. He's Aprendo saying, mucho. <laughs> de usted porque usted también es es una persona muy científica en su trabajo a la doctora Nancy también le agradezco mucho verla siempre hemos convivido en muchos lugares gracias doctora gracias a toda su familia y que tengan bendiciones durante estos días de difuntos que los ancestros los acompañen en todos lados Gracias, Doña María. Thank you so much. She says that um, she wants to thank Dr. Nancy and, and she's thanking me as well. She always thanks me. Uh, I thank her. I want to thank you, Nipole Titech, Doña María, because she is my greatest teacher. Um, and she says uh, she's grateful to our ancestors who have given us their their wisdom and are here with us today. And she wishes that your own ancestors will accompany you during this special time. Thank you so much. These are our contacts. Un abrazo, Un abrazo. Hug, virtual hugs for everyone. These are our contacts. If you would like to send us a message, you can find her on Facebook. You can find me on Instagram or send Nos me an email. En Yucatán, Doctora Nancy. And Nancy, she says, can we go to the Yucatan again together? <laughs> Gracias. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, this was such a wonderful, heartwarming, um, nurturing, grounding presentation. I cannot thank you enough. Um, everything I hoped it would be and much, much more. Um, 
And I, I want to say that this is something really unusual happened during this um, presentation. There was a complete community chatting. I mean, it was a community that didn't exist before, but it was all of you participants that came in and the chats went on and on and on. And they were, I've never seen it um, used in this way to build a sense of community and the, and the cooking um, part was fantastic. I know we're all hungry now and wishing we could sit down with Isabel and Dona Maria and have some people with them. I, I wish I just almost can taste. Um, so good. I just think these chats, I hope you're all looking at the chats because they're beautiful, they're heartfelt. And I know this, this uh, presentation, the recording is going to last you know, almost forever on our website, and we'll and we'll tell you how to get to it in a little bit later in this uh, session. But that's something I didn't expect that this would have its own life in the chats. And so I wanted to ask Chris, our wonderful technician here, our specialist, is there any way we can save the chats so they can be part of the a presentation or can people download them somehow or how can we give the chats a little life of their own? Uh, the best I can do is post them as a text transcript on our website and I'll put that alongside with the video when it gets posted. Oh that's just wonderful. That's really wonderful. Thank um, you so much Nancy and actually I see that our dear colleague Alonso Mendez is with us and I hope Pepe Huchim as well. He said he might join us. And I think, yeah, I think he's on too. Yeah, so I would love if, if you don't mind, Chris, I'm not sure if we can uh, incorporate them into this group and uh, perhaps they can say hi and I want to thank them because, you know, it's uh, so much of what we shared is really their knowledge. And I wanted to, to acknowledge that. There he is. Hi, Alonso. Mm -hmm. Como estas? You have to unmute Alonso. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Hola, Mari. Hola. Alonso, mucho gusto verte, hijo. Oh, muchísimas gracias, doña Mari, por su todo tu, tiempo. Sus palabras me tocan el corazón. Gracias. Ah, igual nosotros. We were so happy to see you. <laughs> I remember my one of my first favorite Skypes of my life was with Alonso, and I was sitting on the Navajo Nation, I think, and he was down in Palenque under a, um, a, a shelter. And it was so amazing that technology made that so we could talk back and forth. Welcome, Alonso. We're so happy to see you again after a long time. And at this point, I also want to in introduce our Indigenous Education Institute board chair, Dr. Polly Walker, and we, we're going to turn it over to her to field the questions. And um, Polly, many welcomes for being here. And I know that we're thinking back to a time we were all at IAIA in um, Santa Fe with Alonso and with Polly, mm -hmm. Isabel, and with Ashley and Chris, and probably a whole bunch of you um, Jenny Atkinson and people that I'm trying to think of when we've all been together in the past. So um, big, huge welcomes to you all. So I'm going to turn this over to Polly now and um, and hope, hopefully um, Don Pepe will also be on in some way. So Polly. Thank you, Nancy. Isabel and Doña Maria Wado. Thank you. My, my heart is very full and I think my stomach is empty after looking ah, at this beautiful food and not having any of it. So, thank you. And I would like to start with a question that Alonso posted. It's a question for Doña Maria. So Alonso, rather than my reading that, would you go ahead and ask that question? Sure, thank you. Doña Maria, well, I'll have to ask it in Spanish so she can understand. Maya Alonso. Yeah. Isabel can uh, <laughs> translate. Pues um, el hablar del, del, de la cocina, um, la tradición PIB, de, del PIB, de cocinar uh, uh, en la tierra con piedras calientes. Eso me recuerda mucho al, al, 
a la leyenda y la mitología que habla del, um, del momento primordial de la creación, cuando el, el, la creación se hace, cuando se, se um, establecen o, o se, se ponen tres piedras en el inframundo o en el cielo del inframundo. Y en Palenque yo he notado en el palacio donde hay unas escaleras que van al, al subterráneo del palacio donde hay una representación de tres piedras um, y muchas veces esas tres piedras o se representan solas o arriba de una, una um, tortuga. Pero en este caso las piedras son, este, tienen fuego que emergen, um, tienen el, el símbolo de fuego. Entonces yo imagino que esas piedras son piedras calientes. Sí, ¿verdad? Y entonces uh, yo tenía la curiosidad y, y eh, en este momento um, estoy, estoy este, pensando si las tradiciones de cocina con piedras calientes Uh, y también el, el uso de piedras en el, en el Pibna, que era el, el, el temazcal, uh, eran representativos de ese momento de creación, porque um, en, al cocinar algo en, con piedras, um, algo se transforma, ¿no? el, la masa que, que uh, se preparó eh, se empieza a transformar con el calor y se crea algo, algo que es uh, digno para los dioses, ¿no? Era, era algo, la comida, pues, de los dioses. Entonces, yo quería saber si, ¿qué piensas usted de, de esas, uh, estas ideas? I, I'm going to translate quickly for the, for the rest of us, but uh, thank you, Alonso. So, uh, Alonso was saying that, you know, what he's been thinking about these hot stones in, the, in this oven that was shown in the, where the peeps are cooked. And it says that in the uh, Maya origin story, of course, three stones were placed in the underworld as part of the creation. And that these stones, um, some, sometimes they are represented having fire coming out of them. For example, there's a, a representation in Palenque in the palace as you go down the steps or you're going down into the, this underworld where the, the creation would have been placed. And then you see these three stones with fire. And so he's thinking that stones and fire are part of a transformation, a transformational moment of, you know, the food being cooked also, uh, a very special moment that, that implies that, that a creation is taking place. So he's asking Doña Maria what, what she thinks about that. ¿Qué opina de, de pues, este, pues viéndolo, viéndolo así como dices, ¿no? Que lo has visto en ese lugar allá de Palenque. Y sí, poner las tres piedras es muy sagrado. Porque fíjate que hasta para hacer las tortillas a mano, ponemos el comal y ahí se cocina. Eh, el, las tres piedras tienen el comal y abajo está el fuego. So she says that this is, to her, is very significant because even when they cook tortillas, they do it in a traditional mm -hmm. comal or a hearth that has three stones, always three stones, with a fire in the middle, and the stones also get hot. And then on top, you put a ceramic plate or a pottery plate or a sheet of metal round, which is where you cook the tortillas. Thank you. Gracias, Alonso. And uh, Chris, I think we have Jose Huchim on. Do you think you might bring him on as well? I have added him in. He should be joining in momentarily. Ahí está, Don Pepe también. Esto es como fiesta, Alonso, ¿verdad? This is like a party. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We need our costumes. We do. We need our Halloween costumes now. Yeah. Oh, también. Yeah. Ah, sí. Claro. Sí, Don Pepe, claro. te tienes que mostrar y sacar el, el, el emudecido del... Let's see if he comes on. So, Jose, see, yes. I had another question to, for Doña Mari. Isn't, isn't there a, um, a special tamale that's placed or, or um, put into the pib? Uh, un, un tamale especial que le llaman el, 
el bebé o el niño, no, no me acuerdo cómo se llamaba el, el tamal especial que Dicen, era un poquito más grande especial. que los demás. Ajá. Se pone uno especial en el pib, digamos, pues, diferente de los ajá. demás. Fíjate que sí, muchas personas lo hacen, lo ponen como especial para los, para los niños chicos que, que han fallecido. Ah. Lo hacen así especial. Sí. Pero en el pib en sí se También se puede especial? poner en el pib. O se puede hacer una comidita, una sopita, algo que están acostumbrados los niños difunditos. And I just hear, I see it in the chat from uh, Cookie. Hello, Kiora Cookie. <laughs> so good to, to see that you're here from New Zealand, from Aotearoa. And he says that we also cook our food in the ground like the Maya. We dig a hole, we heat the rocks, cover it with banana leaves. In Tonga, we call it umu, and in, in Hawaiian, it's imu, right? And uh, in Maori, uh, we call it hangi. And he would like to try making a peep mm. in their umu. Yes, go ahead, Cookie, send us some photos. <laughs> oh, it says you can also put uh, fresh corn and cook it underground as well. Mm. Yeah. Fascinating and to see the connections uh, between indigenous people around the world with that ah, cooking tradition. Bless, bless. So, Isabel, we have a question for you. Yes. H has NASA done investigation of any of the Mayan sites? Well, as far as I know, of course, I, my knowledge is limited, but uh, I don't know that there have been investigations of Mayan sites in astronomy. Um, I do remember that with NASA heliophysics, um, with uh, Jim Tiemann and other of our, uh, Rich Vondrak and other of our leaders of uh, heliophysics at the time, when I was at UC Berkeley, we uh, went with the Exploratorium to do a webcast of the descent of Kukulkan, the feather serpent. And so we had many NASA scientists and educators mm -hmm. there. Troy Klein was there and many of our, our friends and colleagues that you may know. And, but as far as I know, there were no investigations of, of, um, of astronomical sites and in particular the observatory, which is you know, the building that even by its own shape, it, it hearkens to an astronomical mm -hmm. observatory. Um, so we know that that structure was used to observe Venus and Mars cycles and lunar cycles. It was the research was done, I think originally mm -hmm. by Anthony Avini. But, um, but as far as I know, uh, From my experience, I haven't seen uh, NASA research done at the uh, my archaeological sites, but definitely lots of wonderful educational programs like we did at that time mm. when we showcased uh, the descent of Kukulkan. That was March 2005, if I remember. Thank you. Fascinating. I have a couple of questions for any of the four of you. I'm going to group them together because they're on a similar theme. The first one is... Um, the multicolor round shape in the kite is interesting. Does a geometric pattern mean something? And the second one is, um, together. sorry, I've lost that one. So yeah, here it is, sorry. I love the writings on the tails of the kites. Can you share any way responses are received if they are and perhaps through dreams at the times of these cardinal points in the year? Alonso, you want to get a go at it? Um, it's a voice to them. It's, I, I'm not so familiar with the, the traditions in Guatemala, but um, it reminds me of um, uh, similar traditions um, that are used in, uh, in Mexico where, where we use the uh, celebrations of the end of the year cycle, for instance, um, where um, we write, um, Uh, notes and things like that and deposit them into a, a hudas or something uh, of, of, of sort and we we put all our our wishes for the bat for the past year and we um, destroy them in a, in a fire um, that um, allows the new the new cycle to begin um, in kind of a pure way um, purif purification by fire Yes, I, I totally feel that the, the, the eight 
uh, points of the cross quarter days and the solstices and equinox on that wheel that I showed is, is actually quite nicely represented in the kites, you know, those natural symmetries. Mm -hmm. So I think that probably there is some, some indication, um, some correlation between the two. Although, you know, kites were introduced a, a bit later in uh, post-colonial. So, but of course, everything is, is coming together mm -hmm. in, in worldviews, in traditions. Um, always that ancestral knowledge shows up in various representations, depending on on the the, the particular culture that we're that we're uh, collaborating with. So we were delighted to go and, and visit Guatemala and learn about the kites and this mm -hmm. notion of that at that time, early November is when the winds come, mm -hmm. but you cannot fly a kite before Day of the Dead because that would be calling the ancestors too mm -hmm. soon. Do you think about those indigenous concepts of right time? Yes. You know, listening to the natural world and everything that's coming together. Yeah. Nice we have. To be, oh, I'm sorry. I, I just want to say, Polly, that I see our friend Mateo Hinojosa. He's from Bolivia and he says that on Day of the Dead in the Island of the Sun in Lake Titicaca, the local children make kites and fly them to communicate with the dead mm. as well. Thank you, Mateo. That's great. So that's also another connection. Yes. Lovely. Uh, we have a, a question here again about different traditions. As Alonzo pointed out, the traditions are different. And this question says, at latitudes where the cross-quarter days do not coincide with Zenith Nader passage, are there separate celebrations on the different days? You know, basically I, I, I did some research on celebrations of Day of the Dead all throughout Latin America. And of course, you know, there's only a, a narrow region where you're within the tropics. Um, and also, uh, I have been working with Peruvians in the Southern Hemisphere, where, of course, you're not, you don't have Nader Passage in November, you have Zenith Passage, it's opposite. Um, but one thing that seems to be common is the Pleiades. So the Pleiades star cluster seems to be connected with death, either when it does its um, culmination, mer meridional culmination at midnight in November, no matter where you are, and the latitude that that's going to happen, and 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 that seems to be the common the common denominator is, is the Pleiades more so than than the sun. On the other mm -hmm. hand, the traditions for for death, um, you know, the cross quarter days will be there, and those are also special. Like even you know the some of the Celtic traditions for Halloween um, are connected to that cross quarter days that is during this time. Thank you, Isabel. I have a, one other question. Is um, Caracol or El Caracol? Uh, what, would Na, what would NASA say about that observatory? Well, I, I think El Caracol it is the name means snail and it actually has a, a circular staircase inside. Um, it is not an empty building, it's actually a stone building, but it has all these windows that have been shown to, to uh, align with particular sighting of Mars or Venus or the moon, uh, special times of the year and in the, the cycles of these planets. So I think that I would hope that NASA, I mean, I'm, I'm an, I consider myself a NASA scientist, perhaps not right now, but all throughout the years that I was at UC Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, um, you know, it is definitely an observatory. Uh, that we need to broaden our definition of what an observatory is, mm -hmm. a place of observation, a place of understanding cycles of the universe that is an observatory, even though it might not look exactly like an observatory that we might find atop of a mountain uh, to do modern astronomical mm -hmm. observations. Thank you very much. Nancy, I'm keeping an eye on the clock and we also don't have any other new questions. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Thank you, Polly. Yes, mm -hmm. Thank you, Polly, and thank you all for your chats. Once again, this this was such a interactive kind of presentation because of the chats. I'm just um, I'm just really happy. Somebody just asked me about my background. Um, I'm uh, Navajo and Cherokee, and I'm um, um, the president of the Indigenous Education Institute. And we have, as I said earlier, we've been in. Um, existed for about 25 years now. We did, I worked um, with my colleague, David Begay on 
Navajo astronomy for all these years, um, 20, at least 20 years. And um, we've done planetarium shows, we've done books where, where um, our passion is in the field of indigenous astronomy. And right now there's a, a wellspring of people working on their own astronomies from their own cultures. So it's not no longer about a people studying a people, but it's the people themselves doing the mm -hmm. research and bringing, bringing it to light. And I guess somebody wanted to know what the image behind me, it's a picture that Chris Terran, who's our technical specialist, and he's also my son, he took um, from an airplane and it's Monument Valley from the air. So it's a, it's a, it's a shoot, um, it's a scene not many people will see. This is, um, uh, I'm just reading off some of the chats right now, but I wanna continue um, a little bit here before we quit. And I wanted to say, the recording of this session will be available like Chris put in the chat. You can download it, it is free of charge. You can use it over and over in your classrooms, in your, um, with your colleagues, with your families. And um, you would go to um, indigenous education, www.indigenouseducation.org. Chris can put it in the chat again. He's put it in several times during this last hour. And so um, I want to extend a special, a very special thank you to our technical support, Chris Terran from Terran Solutions in Friday Harbor, Washington. If it weren't for your skills, none of this would be happening. Um, <laughs> My pleasure, thank you. I want to thank Polly. I want to thank um, um, all, all of uh, for your for your your building the questions. I want to thank Isabel and Donya Maria, especially for your knowledge and wisdom. Big hearts for sharing and uh, the beauty of the presentation, the slides, the language, the people. It's just amazing. Um, I also want to thank our primary sponsor, which is NASA Heat, for this particular session from the Goddard Space Flight Center. And we have partners that have supported us in the past, which I'd like to acknowledge the BLM, the Collaborative Action and Dispute Resolution and Program Lead, Marcia de Chardonnay, um, as well as the San Juan Island National Historical Park and Superintendent Alexis Friedi and Park Cultural Anthropologist Joe Dolan. Now, this is important. We're going to send out a survey to you just after this presentation. And we're gonna ask your re reaction to what you've heard today. And I, and I really beg you to urge you to um, answer the questions because it helps us to inform our future program design. Um, the, the ones in the past with um, list, people listening to Leroy Little Bear and Robin Kimmerer, Greg Cajete, all Ella Henrietta Mann, they've been amazing, um, amazing source of inspiration for us to read what people have to say. So I urge you to stay on and answer these questions and, and, and send them back to us. The other thing we want to ask you, because so many people have gone back to work now, as the pandemic hopefully is winding down, we want to hear from you as to the best time hour and day and day of the week for these presentations to occur. This would be helpful for us also. Um, I also want to let you know that we're starting a new version of this speaker series that's going to be called A Sense of Place, Indigenous Perspectives of the Land and Waters of the Salish Sea. Um, and um, that's up here in Puget Sound area of Washington State. And our first speaker is going to be Larry Campbell, who is a renowned speaker and a wisdom keeper from the Swinomish Nation near LaConnor, Washington. If you'd like to be included on our Salish Sea mailing list, please let us know by adding your name and email to the survey. And from all of us, I just extend heartfelt gratitude and thank you. This was a truly a astonishing and wonderful um, uh, presentation. And I see that Isabel's also mentioning a wonderful article, Living with the Stars on the Day of the Dead from Astro Beat Magazine. You, you can um, download this from the chat. I, I read it, it's, it's, it's really a great article. So um, I think that's the end of our day with you. I hope you all go out and make your own version of a peep. <laughs>
<laughs> or at least need something um, uh, that honors this day. And um, think of it as in early November, those kites and the, and the beautiful way the ancestors are regarded and uh, they're not, they haven't gone away. They're, they're constantly being cared for by their relatives. I think it's such a beautiful concept mm -hmm. and held by so many different indigenous peoples. So um, that's all I have to say for now. So thank you all so much for being with us and have, have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Adios, Maria. Uh, adios, hola, hola. Hijo. Hasta pronto. Quédate, no uh, se vayan. No se vayan. Uh, no se vayan. Uh,